This podcast is produced by Deloitte. The views and opinions expressed by podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Deloitte. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice or services of any kind. For additional information about Deloitte, go to Deloitte.com forward slash about. Welcome to Architecting the Cloud, part of the On Cloud podcast, where we get real about cloud technology, what works, what doesn't, and why. Now, here's your host, Mike Cavis. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Architecting the Cloud podcast, where we get real about cloud technology. We discuss what's new in the cloud, how to use it, and why, but most importantly, with the people in the field who do the work every day. I'm your host, Mike Cavish, Chief Cloud Architect over at Deloitte. Today, I'm joined by Josh Atwell. Josh is a Senior Technology Advocate at Splunk, focusing on helping IT organizations evolve to support the growing demands on them. He's a co-author of several popular books, serial podcaster, as I am, and has led numerous technology user groups and is an awarded public speaker, never known for lacking an opinion, which we will find out here shortly. He guest blogs on various platforms and tweets at Josh underscore Atwell. Welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about some of that stuff I just talked about, some of the stuff you wrote, some of the podcasting you do. Sure thing. Thanks, Mike. I'm excited to be here. Uh, yeah, in my uh, in my career, I've I've taken a lot of different journeys through the virtualization space, data center automation, uh, merging out into the cloud. Worked for the customer side, vendor side, uh, and was involved with producing a variety of different podcasts. It's a interesting industry that we're in, and it seems that as uh, all the things evolve and change, there's always new and interesting things to talk about. Absolutely. And, and one of the things you, where I first met you is at the first New Ops conference, another great buzzword, but tell us what that movement's about. Sure. So New Ops is a rationalization and recognition that uh, IT operations has changed dramatically and transformation is required in order for IT professionals and the, and the organizations to be able to support the needs of the customers and the business uh, and their own needs for that matter. And while I'm a huge proponent and advocate for DevOps as a uh, as a practice and a principle, you know, the needs for IT professionals extend beyond just supporting developers. They've got a lot of tenured applications. They've got cloud initiatives, Kubernetes, and containerized initiatives, backup and networks and VoIP, and just a lot of different things that have changed for them. And so we put together new ops days and focus on conversation around new ops to focus on IT ops professionals and how they can be a contributor and, and tie into things like DevOps, but also how do they address the multitude of new challenges that are facing them? Yeah. And I, you mentioned a lot of technologies there, you know, back in the day, we pretty much had like a mainframe an AIX box or some three tier application. And I think it was a lot simpler to, to keep tabs on things, to operate and run things. Right. And where today, you know, we spin stuff up and down, we, you know, we got Kubernetes containers, microservices, everything's getting very distributed and complex, which is starting to see a rise of a new buzzword, AI ops, which is, you know, kind of, uh, and, and I'll, before I ask you what AI ops is, I, I created this image and posted it out to get feedback. That's kind of how our conversation started. And it was kind of showing, you know, I've been in this space for a long time, like yourself, the evolution of operations where, you know, traditionally or in companies that are, don't have mature practices, you know, we have what I call reactive operations where you react to, to alerts. And usually that means something's broken and there's some customer impact. And then, you know, for many years, many companies moved to more proactive operations. So in, back in my day, a lot of that was being served as a developer through APM tools. So we would say, we would set some targets, performance targets, and when the performance of a API or, or some unit of work moved 5% either direction, we would go address it before the client did. Now we get into what I'm calling intelligent ops or AI ops, and there's, there's assisted operations. So the machines are doing the learning, you know, you got artificial intelligence, but they're making recommendations for us to act. And then you get into augmented ops where the machines are actually acting. And then to the end of the spectrum is autonomous operation, self-healing, self-running, self-monitoring, and you start thinking about things like self-driving cars and stuff like that. So throwing all that out there, it's a lot of stuff, but AI ops, another buzzword, and we love buzzwords, and 
the hard thing about buzzwords is it means a lot of things, a lot of people. So before we get into talking about this stuff, how would you define AI ops to someone new to it? Yeah. And I think you touch on a, a lot of important stuff there. The, the way that we have to maintain application availability and servicing need uh, definitely has changed a lot. And one of, the, one of the things that's interesting about AI ops as a term, so it was first coined by Gartner back in 2016. And the, the thing that's great about it is it gives this visual, like everybody has a sense of what it should mean. And uh, as you said, though, everybody gets to put their own definition. Um, for me, uh, I, I think the easiest way to outline it is putting more trust in machines to do what machines are good at and allowing uh, and augmenting the capacity of humans to do what they're uniquely capable of doing uh, when it comes to you know, maintaining and operating the environment. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty good way. I'm going to have to steal that. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> well, it's on the recording, so uh, yeah. you, you definitely have access to it. <laughs> yeah, and we do and we do podcast notes, so I have it in writing too. So. Oh, nice. We're going to focus a lot on AI ops in this in this talk, and and even some talk about operating models. So we were just talking before we kicked this off, and one of the things you know when we get a new technology. We tend to think binary, and it's like you either got to use all of this or none of it. And the answer is always somewhere in between. And I think where we settled is you should look at it workload by workload and figure out, you know, what do I need? Do I need just a proactive operations? Do I need assisted? Do I need augmented? You know, what do I need rather than go out and buy platforms uh, right out of the gates? So, um, so the question to you is, you know, all, we got all these tools, got all these technologies, we got bots, we got all this stuff. Before we adopt all these technologies, what needs to change? You know, you, you mentioned operating models, stuff like that, but what needs to change before we start buying tools? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing that has to change is that IT professionals, their leadership and the businesses have to get much more adept at defining what their key service level objectives are for the applications that they're supporting as they continue to rationalize where an application needs to be served, whether they continue to host in-house on-premises, you know, some of those tenured ap- applications that never go away, or whether or not they migrate that functionality to the cloud, either as a software as a service offering, uh, lift and shift, if you will, and just you know, placing that application in the cloud where it's managed there instead, or refactoring it because of its you know, business value and being able to have that agility. Uh, but acknowledging that the operating model for each one of those decisions uh, is likely to be different when you look at it end to end uh, and identifying tools and you know, operational procedures that um, you know, are a common denominator for, for each of those. You know, so you're always going to want to monitor logging. You're always going to want to look at metrics. You're always going to want to be collecting data and telemetry and understanding what's happening in the environment. With some of those models, you're going to be adding a tremendous amount of complexity and the velocity and variety of data that's going to be coming in that, to support IT being able to make decisions and understand what's happening in the environment is going to continue to you know, accelerate and become more, much more and more difficult for you know, the IT professionals to consume. Uh, so that's, you know, that recognition and that acknowledgement is, is like a big first step. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, talking about operating models here, a lot of the the companies, especially the born in the cloud or some of the unicorns who are really, really good at this have, have shifted a lot of responsibility left, meaning they a lot of them have teams that both build and run, which, you know, we hear terms like SRE and those types of things. But a lot of organizations are still trying to centralize all ops, right? We've always had the data center team do the ops, you know, and we're going to the cloud, but this is still the ops team. And I find that a challenge because, cert- like, if I'm doing an IoT app and I have devices all over the place and then I'm ingesting all this data, I, I think it takes a little different skill set to to really be productive in operating that type of thing as a traditional end tier. So, you know, at Splunk, you guys see a lot of customers. Do you see some kind of abandonment of the central body operating everything and more distributing operations out into the BUs or at least out into the products? Or do you still see people clinging on to the old model? 
Yeah, it's very much a little column A and a little column B. Uh, and and I think that goes back to what you were saying at the very beginning. Like None of this is binary. It's not black and white. There's a lot of gray. And to be fair, a lot of operational discipline that has been applied for IT operations for the last you know de- few decades, right, um, aren't necessarily applied today because... Uh, the systems can self heal in ways where it's not ne- not as necessary or there's sufficient resources or there's other mechanisms in the process of that application functioning that can offload some of that. And so I, I, I think the big challenge that most of the organizations are facing is, okay, we have a new application that a line of business is developing. Uh, they decided to deploy it in the cloud because they need the agility and the flexibility and the scalability that the cloud provides. Their core IT department isn't uh, adept at managing applications in the cloud. They don't have strong visibility into the application and uh, how the application has changed, all the services that it's consumed. And so initially, the you know, line of business is taking a lot of ownership from, from an operational standpoint. And you know, not to cry foul on developers, but you know, operational discipline is not the discipline that they've invested in. Right, they're they're developers, and that's what they do. So they're having to learn operational discipline alongside their operations peers, who are now having to learn more about application engineering and in the frameworks of the software and and the services that are being consumed. And and I'm seeing more and more organizations who are looking at how do we increase that operational sympathy between the various teams. Uh, DevOps is being a big part of helping with that. And then how do we utilize tools? that can add value, information, and be part of our processes for both sides from development and operations, regardless of whether we're residing on-premises with our application or the application is being deployed in one of the cloud services. So do you see any clients changing goals and objectives of traditional ops? So the reason why I say that is I, I see too often people see these these roadmaps that people like me and you put out, this is, you know, where stuff's heading, but they only go there from a technology standpoint. So they follow the tech trend, but they don't change any people in process. So if I'm still incented the old way, it's, you know, does it work? So are you seeing the people are successful changing goals and incentives of people in operations and dev and security along the way, or is it still pretty much COEs, you know, just contributing people to the cause? Yeah, I, I think given the rate of digital transformations that falter or fail is a, an, a leading indicator that change is very difficult. And I know that's a cop-out answer. I respect that. <laughs> <laughs> but organizations are going to, you know, when it comes to IT operations, they're going to move slowly. Um, some organizations are going to move more quickly than others, but a lot of aspects of the business are going to move very slowly. And the indicator that I use, uh, and you know, as I've talked with analysts and I talk with customers, is when you look at how an IT organization and the business funds technology and when they look at their budget and how they apply their budget to supporting the technology that supports the business. And that is usually a key indicator as to whether or not change is happening. And some of those things that you'll note are the transition from a cost model to where everything is CapEx to OpEx, where they're moving from taking applications that you know, they want to be out of the business of managing and just consuming as a service, being able to reduce the footprint of infrastructure in their on-premises data centers, simplify that infrastructure, whether it's um, you know, defining their own pod model or consuming a hyper-converged infrastructure, uh, and then looking at you know, when they use the cloud, which services they use in the cloud, how they operate and manage those. And, and so the, the answer is you're going to get a little bit of both in an organization, but I think most uh, IT departments, they are, they're having some difficulty in making this transition because in large part of the way they've been measured. And unfortunately, the measurements around uptime you know, your mean time between failure and you know, your mean time to resolution is uh, are still key metrics. What should be the new metrics in this new world or, or maybe additional metrics that we should look at? Yeah, KPI mapping is a really tough discipline. Uh, and I think uh, a large part of you know, the new KPIs being looked at are around service level objectives and recognizing 
that the latest generation of applications, they don't necessarily fall flat like your traditional monolithic application would, right? They can, they can have uh, deprecated availability without being fully down. And so a lot of that measurement is let's don't go completely down. Let's just make sure we stay ahead of um, you know, any, any service degradation because as a business, we recognize that you know a twenty percent uh, degradation in service you know yields x amount of dollars lost in revenue, and we've tried to apply that in the past with like our web web commerce and and you know, people abandoning carts and all. And the the real key there, of course, is having visibility. And as we talk about things like AI ops, more intelligent operational systems. A big part of that is being able to look at those environments, look at those service level objectives and defining what the acceptable behavior from the environment is and then responding quickly in order to maintain it. Uh, That's where these systems are going to start really kicking in and coming to play. Yeah, and I think we we should be designing for ops, right? So we have these powerful tools that can help us, you know, do augmentation and stuff like that. But if we're still just building code, focusing on features and not building for operations, we really can't take advantage of these tools. So how have you seen companies or clients work better together so that they're thinking about not just a feature to the customer, but how do I deploy this and run it better from a developer? You know, how are developers contributing to that? Yeah, I, th- I think a big part of that comes in operations teams providing visibility and tooling or, or and assisting with tooling that lets the development team and the line of business that's leading that application understand the impact that the application's having uh, on infrastructure and on infrastructure spend, you know, if it's in the cloud, for instance, and you know, providing that data and making sure that they can see that. You know, long-term sustainability of an application you know, far exceeds the amount of time it took to write that code. Right? And every piece of code that you put out there, it's going to stay out there until you change that piece of code. And if you write a, a function or a service that doesn't change very much, you know, from a you know, lines of code change perspective, like that's that means the bulk of its time is spent under operational concern. And you know, there was a lot of jokes this week talking about um, the unfortunate uh, view of the stock market as as things have been reacting to the coronavirus. Somebody made the comment about, oh, great, somebody fixed the, uh, thanks for fixing that memory leak. Well, memory leaks is a great example of you know, an application being, being made where, and, I, and we've all experienced it, right? You know, where system runs out of memory because there's a memory leak and it's you know, holding on to memory or it's consuming excessive amounts of disk space and filling up a, a mount point or a drive. Like those things still happen. And they still happen on your next generation applications as well. And so by providing visibility to the developers and you know, operationally keeping an eye on those things and then implementing systems who are intelligent enough to see those and notify early that they can see the trend on uh, you know, that hard drive is filling up. Those are the key areas where, you know, from an operations standpoint, become exceedingly important. So um, when I was walking through the kind of five phases or five types of operations, you know, one of them that we talked about before we jumped on here was augmented operations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the one that made yours pop up more than others. So give us an example where you see the benefit of an augmented operation. What is it? And then where have you seen that applied? It's real beneficial. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, so as an organization you know, develops out uh, shared services, either you know, APIs that serve uh, multiple applications, uh, think of maybe an inventory or a customer database you know, interaction from, from an API standpoint, as those services are, are delivered out, they become key to multiple functions of business. And what's nice is that like most computer systems, software systems, they can become fairly predictable over time, right? They, they have their own cadence, if you will. And it's, uh, it is something that over time you can identify and get a feel for like what's normal behavior for an application, how it's going to respond during seasonal peaks, how it's going to respond when there's a snow day in a region like you can, or, or the situation that we're dealing with around the world with more people working from home. 
what's what's important with augmented operations is having the platform be able to see when you know uh, an anomaly is presenting itself you know anomalous behavior where you anticipate specific patterns in the application and in the systems that are supporting the applications. And then there are typically leading indicators that something is going wrong or starting to present itself as, as going wrong. Humans don't always do a great job of seeing the leading indicators, right? We're really good at seeing spikes, you know, either up or down. Um, we're good at seeing color variation prevented, you know, being presented to us with green, yellow, and red. But being able to look at millions of transactions, millions of logs, like this large volume of data, and then correlated data, data between multiple systems, we don't really have the capacity to do that in flight, in real time. So we require tools to help us do that. And that's when the aug- augmentation comes in, because as these systems can identify trends or anomalous behavior or, or something that the system either recognizes and, and knows who to contact to resolve or see something that look, this is looking bad based on something I've seen before, S- somebody needs to take a look at this, right? You're, you're now empowering the IT operations professionals and the developers to get ahead of a potential service degradation or an outage. Yeah, it's pretty powerful stuff. I remember in my day, you know, you'd have your big dashboard up with the health and then you'd have like 10 tabs open. One's running a collect, another one's running a trace. And then you're catting some program you wrote, piping it to mm-hmm. <laughs> out. And you, and you just like, you just have to be looking at the right thing at the right time, to even have a prayer of seeing that something's going south where, and as we move towards highly distributed complex applications, it's just almost humanly impossible to to be proactive without tooling is kind of my experience. I don't know if you've seen the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. It is humanly impossible for for someone to be able to to track all of that, particularly to track it 24-7, uh, yeah. which is, you know, all of our applications are always on, right? There's always somebody looking for an Uber ride. There's always somebody making a bank transaction. There's always somebody doing something like this. All this stuff is completely on all the time. And these platforms can be on all the time as well. It could go on and on. And this is a topic near and dear both of our hearts. So thanks for coming out today. Appreciate your time today. Cool conversation. That's it for Architecting the Cloud. Josh, just repeat your Twitter handle to everyone's. Highly recommend they follow. You're doing some good stuff over there. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's at Josh underscore Atwell. And uh, I'm blogging again at josh-atwell.com. To learn more about Deloitte or read today's show notes, head over to www.deloittecloudpodcast.com. You'll find my podcast and my friend Dave Linticum just by searching for Deloitte on Cloud Podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Mike Cavus. If you'd like to contact me directly, you can reach me at mcavis at Deloitte.com or find me on Twitter, madgreek65. And thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Architecting the Cloud. Thank you for listening to Architecting the Cloud, part of the On Cloud Podcast with Mike Cavus. Connect with Mike on Twitter, LinkedIn, and visit the Deloitte On Cloud blog at deloitte.com forward slash us forward slash deloitte dash on dash cloud dash blog be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app